Hello again folks on this beautiful June day, 19th of June 2019, got it right this time. <laughs> um, I'm interviewing Trey, uh, my colleague, in relation to her personal journey from the mental health issues that she uh, had uh, and still to a certain extent has in relation to her trauma. Um, she's going to talk about how she moved on from that the stages that she went through, one of which was the uh, achievement with the deadlift, yeah. which we're dead proud of, um, right through to, to, to the end where we hope, and this will inspire other people who are struggling with their mental health issues, to maybe just have a go and see what comes up. So Trey, do you want to begin? Yes, um, it's sometimes it's difficult for me to think about where I am now and where I was before I started. Um, you know, briefly, uh, we got into the health and well-being, the exercise to help uh, Nigel, who gets the support from SS2, and you asked me to get involved in that because I had some problems myself. Um, the emotional, um, mental health and trauma was having an impact on my health. I had um, a condition that caused I me to be underweight a lot of the times. I had muscle atrophy. Uh, I had pain and all that kind of thing that came with it. I was weak. I was very concerned about that at the time, and so I decided to have a go. And uh, didn't know what I could do because I was struggling to pick up a heavy lever arch file and a bag of sugar. So look at your history then. What, what was your history of exercise then? What 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 activities did you take part in that, that perhaps give you some kind of fitness base to start with? Well, prior to becoming ill. Um, I used to cycle a lot and walk a lot. I'd never done weight training uh, and some yoga. And I used um, a resistance band that I had with the yoga and that was about it. That's what I did. I felt reasonably um, fit. I did quite a bit of more cardio, so I was always slim. I was never muscular. But I felt reasonably fit. I wasn't exhausted all the time. I felt okay. Um, and then it all went a bit wrong and what I had disappeared you know I, and it went very quickly um, I struggled with that I must be honest because I could walk and I could cycle and I could do my yoga and then suddenly it went from that to nothing and when I cycled I was so exhausted I was collapsing and I couldn't walk very far and so, just give up on yoga so the activities that you were taking part in what 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 guidance did you have before you started doing them? Was it something that you did from any age? Oh, I, I walked and I cycled from a very young age. We didn't have a car, so I wasn't brought up um, with a car, so I had to get A to B, you walked or you cycled. The, the yoga came later on because I noticed I wasn't very flexible. I wouldn't think about the strength, it was the flexibility I used it for. Um, and I dipped in and out of that for a while. I didn't go to classes, I got a video and it was a good one and I was able to follow that and I did that for quite a long time and then for some strange reason I stopped I think it was when I was studying I didn't have much time and then I went back into it when I became ill because I realized I needed something because I was very slim so yeah so when you became ill how much exercise did you do after or before when you became ill it went from every day to barely anything. It just knocked everything out of me. I was um, the bowel disease um, was so painful, and the side effects of that, I had nothing left. I mean, it, it, it became I became very weak, um, and because of the side effects, I couldn't really go very far because I needed to get to the facilities. Um, so yeah, basically I was incapacitated for a lot of the time. So how did that impact on your trauma? Massively. I mean, it was scary. Um, I was really frightened. And the side effects were awful. I was really frightened. Um, and it was, it was almost like the only thing I could think about was how to get through a day. I didn't have anything else left to deal with anything else that came at me. So the stresses of life became uh, too much, overwhelming, because all, all I could think about was physically getting out of bed, being able to wash and dress, possibly having a meal and trying to get to work and then getting through a day at work. 
with the pain and everything I was dealing with. So that was just awful. So what exercise did you do during that time then? I tried to cycle, I had to give up. I used to turn up at work and collapse, literally end up on the floor, I had nothing left. And obviously my work uh, employees were very concerned about that and said, I'm sorry, you can't be coming to work in that state. And he's understandable. So I tried just to walk the dogs and sometimes I used to have to go back home. I couldn't get very far either because of the pain or because I needed to go to the bathroom. That was very frustrating. So I'd gone from a few miles walking a day to lucky to do a mile. That was unbelievable. I just couldn't get my head around that. It happened so quickly. And I lost any fitness I had very quickly. It, it just went. So as you are now, and you reflect on then, how did you begin the process to get to where you are now, given the conditions that you had and still have? Uh, what were the stages that you went through? Talk about the early stages that you went through. With the, the weight training, um, I started with light weight. For anybody else, there would be very light weight. For me, it was massive. You know, to be able to pick up a couple of one kilogram weights was a major event for me. Um, and I felt extremely heavy after a few reps of anything. And I remember that. I mean, I was suffering before I even left the room after the session. Um, my body was in so much pain and <laughs> it was just so, and I was so tired. I mean, I was exhausted and I would spend two, three, four days after that being in this utter exhausted, painful state on top of what I was dealing with anyway. And yet you still persisted, so what, what enabled you to, to persist with? The workouts, which I know you did because I was actually taking the workouts. What was it um, that kept you going? If there's anybody listening to this this blog now, uh, you know, what would your recommendations be in order to, to keep on pushing on, to get beyond that that first stage, which is quite clearly difficult for you? Because what was it? Uh, I think part of it was fear, because I knew I was ill, and I knew it could get worse. And I was frightened of that um, happening. And so it was almost like I focused on, I need to get better, I need to get stronger, and this is the way it happens. And so I, I accepted it was going to be difficult. I accepted the pain because if I didn't do what I was doing, it was going to get an awful lot worse. I was going to be housebound. Um, I was going to be... Uh, could even be bed bound and that was not something I wanted to face I didn't want to com be completely like that so yeah it was fear driven um, and when I started to see small improvements I, I grasped onto that as well I focused on those improvements right okay I'm starting to make improvements there's only a little and it's, it's one week at a time but I'm, it's getting a bit easier and that's what I held on to as well, I focused on that positive bit. Tell me what the improvements were. Um, I got so that the pain of the exercise routines didn't last as long um, and my endurance, the exhaustion wasn't quite as bad and then we, were in, we started to inclu include um, the sprint training and that knocked me back but then I, I came, I got stronger again. Then we included some longer walks. And again, that knocked me back. It was almost like I was taking two steps back and then crawling back forward. Um, but then it became, everything became slightly easier. It wasn't massively easier all of a sudden. It was a slow progress. Um, but I could see it, I could feel it. Uh, I, I would get up in the morning and it wasn't quite so painful. I could actually... Instead of crawling to the bathroom, I could walk a bit better. Uh, I wasn't so exhausted after the session. I wasn't so exhausted for so long. Yes, those improvements, it came over a few weeks, but it was there. And then I could increase what I was doing in a week. As in, I would do some running, maybe 
once a week. I know maybe a week, the second week I would do a, a longer walk, so it was intermittent. Um, and that went on for about 12 months, the first 12 months. And then I got my first set of weights and that changed because I was also doing yoga. I increased the yoga in that first 12 months, so I would inc increase the yoga sessions at home uh, on top of the weight training and around the long walks and the sprint training. Um, I did that at first, that's the first 12 months, and then I got my own set of weights, the first set of weights, and included more weight training within the week. I, it knocked me back sometimes, I was doing too much in a week, I had to balance that out so that I wasn't too exhausted and straining my muscles and over tiring them to still make small improvements. So that was a learning process. So would people um, expect, if they went on that journey, and I'm hoping people do, uh, if you were to advise them, um, what would be the expectation from someone to guide them? Would they need guidance? Uh, if they came from a background with no real uh, experience in fitness at a particular level, yeah. would they need some kind of guidance? And if they did, what would, it, what would they expect from that guidance? Uh, you know, because you, you can be trained by people who will push you through to get fitter, but they'll ignore the actual mental battles. So this, this is a physical and a, a mental it journey. Is, yeah. um, so what would, you, what would you advise people what to expect if someone's going to help them? You know, would it be a, a, a personal trainer? Would it be someone in a gym? Would it be a friend? You know, what, what, would, you, what would you advise them? I think if you have no background, you do need guidance. However, I think that some honesty is, is required um, and also being aware of your body and how it affects you. If you go to somebody to train you and you say, right, th I have no experience and I'm dealing with this. I have this injury, I have this pain, I have whatever. The trainer needs to take that on board whoever it is that trains you and advises you. They need to look at your capabilities and they should take you slowly and gently through the process. We don't go from hero to, you know, zero to hero and, and cause all kinds of problems because you're going to be knocked back. You need to be able to adapt to the training and make uh, improvements that you can see and you can cope with. A trainer has been doing something for many years has maybe forgotten what it was like to be back here at the start, but they need to remember that, and they need to work with each person and work around that, because they're not going to get where they need to be or it will be helpful for them by jumping f and then feeling like, oh, I can't do that, I can't cope, because that knocks you back and maybe even makes you walk away. So at the point of wanting to walk away, uh, the, the responsibility of the person who's guiding you, the, the trainer or whatever you want to call them, um, you, you can have someone push you through, which you might fight back against. Yeah. Uh, you can have someone that will uh, not necessarily, you know, enable you to, to, to go beyond your normal uh, comfort zones. What would you expect that trainer to do when you were defeated and you don't really want to carry on? What would you expect from that trainer? Because if you go back in time early on with your journey, mm. there were times when you... Um, Listen to that voice, I can't do this, yeah? Not in a defeatist way, but just because you'd never really been there before. Yeah. So once you'd got there, what would you expect from someone that was guiding you when you said to them, look, I'm struggling here now? What would you expect to be told? Because remember, this is for people who were struggling with not just physical, but also mental battles. Yeah. I think I would like, um, I would need a person to say, right, okay, where have, we, where have you come from? And where are you at this point? Um, and now we find a way for you to get past this obstacle. It's in, we do it in stages. Right, if you want to do a deadlift and you can't get it up the, off the floor because you feel it's too heavy, we do it a little bit at a time. We just kind of lift it up, put it back down. And again, put it back down. Walk away from it, come back. We'll try it again, see how far you get. And you do it until eventually you do it. You know you can do it. But this is 
facing it and walking away, facing it and walking away. It, it's not, it's fine to walk away, but we come back to it. And, he's, and they're there with you, right, okay, how do you feel about this? How far can we go this time? And it, it's giving you the confidence to say, right, okay, I don't think I could do I, I don't feel like, but I'm actually doing a little bit here. Oh, wait a minute, I'm doing a little bit more. Right, today I'm going to do it. You, know, you, you get that mindset. If you go to, say, do a deadlift and say to somebody, right, in the next four weeks, we're going to try and get you to pick up your body weight. They've never done anything before. We've never done any weightlifting or anything. We're going to do this training, we're going to get you through, we're going to pick up your body weight in four weeks. Four weeks' time, you can't do it. Because you're not, let's be honest, you wouldn't be able to do it. It's crazy. What are you going to do at this point? You've failed. And you're going to feel like you've failed. So we don't have that kind of um, a goal. We don't set those goals. This is an increment. This is, okay, a little bit further, a little bit further, a little bit further. It's not these massive goals over here. You get to it gradually, and then before you know it, you're there. So on that journey, who is it that chooses to do that? Is it the trainer or the individual? You do it together. Because if, if, you, if a person is training and has real difficulties and they don't think they can do this, the trainer finds a way to help you do that. Sneaky? Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> Maybe just doing it in, and just saying, oh, wait a minute, let's do this. And then before you know it, wait a minute, I've just picked up such and such. We've only done a couple of reps, but I've done it. The power of distraction. Oh, also helping you do it slightly until there's a time where it, you, go, you go beyond. And you've it, done that with me a few yeah, times. Yeah, is that, is that building an individual's belief in their abilities? Yes, I feel it is, especially if you don't think you can. If you've got to a stage in your life, or if maybe you had a lot of attrition in your life, which I had, um, and any, th any goals, it was on my own because there was nobody else there. And then suddenly what goals you had got is gone. And you're st starting from scratch again, thinking this major wall of, oh God, and I feel dreadful. You need that. So you mentioned attrition. And for anybody out there who um, doesn't understand what attrition means, you can look it up, uh, it's a gradual wearing away of something yeah. and I think in, well no, I don't think I know, in your case you were exposed to quite a volume of yeah. attrition from different quarters. From a young age right through my marriage. Yes. You don't have to mention, <coughs> but attrition can be um, a very damaging act for an individual and Let's have a drink now. And in your case, it was extremely damaging. Yes, it was. Now, if anybody out there who's been exposed to attrition by some individual, it might be in a relationship or it might be family, this, this can damage someone's self-worth and self-confidence. We've been already living with a mental health condition. Uh, the last thing you want is, is to, to be exposed to attrition from people around you. You need to have support from them to build up that self-worth and self-belief again. So can you explain to me how that attrition affected you? It took away all my confidence. Um, any confidence I had when I was working and studying came from what I achieved through work and studying. And that was me uh, giving myself these challenges because I felt, I, I knew it felt good for me. Um, it was beneficial. And that was even from just doing college courses to doing my degree with the OU to what I achieved at work. Uh, it, I had no support from anybody. Um, there was nobody said, oh, well, how well are you doing with your studies at work or anything like that. And, but I felt it was something for me. When I had to give up work, or when I became ill, I had to go part-time, change work, and then give up work, it was awful. It was kind of, everything I'd tried to do for myself was just, it wasn't there anymore. And the only thing I had was this other stuff. No support, put-downs, you know, not being able to achieve anything in anybody else's eyes. And that was 
horrendous. W what would you class that as a form of abuse? Oh, definitely. It, it, it took away my confidence, my self-worth. I literally just spent all of my time doing what other people wanted to do because they knew better and it's almost like you've been conditioned. So just to step outside your personal journey, which we'll come back to again in a moment, what do you think that that's quite prevalent within uh, certain care systems? Oh, yeah, definitely, uh, yeah. People who live with different disabilities and mental health problems, do you think that people with those problems are also exposed to attrition? Yes, I have seen it. I've, um, and I've seen the effect it has on the people in care. Um, and it's just so difficult to see because you, you know it stays with them, that person. They are struggling to be able to do things in life and nobody's supporting them and saying, actually, you're doing really well. And supporting them and uh, to do to their capabilities and beyond. So, so you've got an individual within the care system, whether it be service, charity, whatever, uh, who already has an existing mental health condition and make no bones about this, when you have a, a mental health condition, you are in many ways exposed to stigma. Yeah. It, it, you know, I, I know in nowadays people talk about talking about it and I mentioned about Prince Harry talking about it and Prince William and Kate, etc. Which actually has had no effect whatsoever as far as I'm concerned. It hasn't resourced it anymore. It hasn't actually reached out to more people. You can talk as much as you want, you know, but actually action is what's what's needed. Yeah. And money, funding, which I'm gonna do a separate podcast on mm. at some point in the future. Um so in relation to that, someone in a service, should there be provision for time with that individual to build that self worth, that that confidence and reduce the stigma of the mental health condition? Should that be built in? Is it a is it fundamental to any service? I believe it is, yes. I mean, if somebody is t dealing with difficulties and they won't see that they are able to do anything, so if you find things that they can do and work on that with them, it gives them a sense of achievement and improves their self-worth and confidence and that can or going to other things in their life, well, wait a minute, I managed to do this, um, I could try that. They're actually more likely to try things, whereas we seen it in sessions and there was a, a lady that used to come regular. Every time I showed her something, I can't do that. I can't do that, sad. So I say, well, okay, what is it you think is difficult? I used to have to sit down and go through it with her. Right, we could do this. Why don't we try that? And I used to, have to sit down and do that. The first thing I ate was, I can't do that, sad. I can't do that. And nobody had worked on that with her. And so everything was difficult. So if everything's difficult, you won't do anything. You won't try anything. So if, if we look at mental health and well-being as the fundamental premise for, for progression, uh, being quite comfortable in your, in, your, in your world, in your life, surely that, that is something that should be built into a, a social care system. And that is that that individual's mental health is worked with just the same as it's worked with, say, they go to a college course or whatever. Because I mentioned to you earlier there about mental health isn't something that just occurs at certain times. This is a lifelong yes, situation. It so it's no good sending somebody off to sit with someone for, for an hour and talk about how you're feeling and then plunge them back into a service where it's not being recognised because there's nothing built in. No. And we know, <clears throat> we know implicitly that there are individuals who... Once they show a little bit of independence, you know, and these are people who, who have had long-term mental health conditions, they've been in long-term mental health hospitals, as soon as that, that comes up, all oh, right, they're okay. Mm. So these individuals are out there wandering the streets, you know, catching buses to places, still with that mental health condition, and nobody's working with it. I think as well, uh, you know, they'll make, uh, they'll show a little bit of progression, and then the left, so it's lost because then they start floundering and that has an impact on what little you know, gains they've made. So they lose those gains. Uh, it's just, if they have difficulties, people have difficulties, they need that support always to keep them in a better place so they can make some, you know, be 
reasonably independent or have some kind of independence, they always need that support. You can't just say, oh, well, you're doing all right, then walk away, because they'll, they'll flounder, they'll crash. So could you use the excuse that we haven't got enough money and we haven't got enough staff? <coughs> is that an excuse, is that a good enough excuse to, to let somebody down? who's got a mental health condition? No, they should find a way to make the, the, the staff and the money available. I mean, it should be there. It, it shouldn't be something that you think is going to get better. It, it's something that has to be in place all the time. So once a person has these difficulties, they have them. That's it. You don't just kick them off the end of their books because, oh, well, they, they know this and that. No, we can walk away. That's not how it works. They're always going to, they always need you there. So if you take someone into your service, and they've got a record of mental health issues uh, and you have nothing in place to, 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 to manage that, that mental health condition, do you have the right to take that person in your service? I don't think you should be taking people in your service if you can't give them the, uh, the support they require. I mean, it's, 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 it's wrong. I mean, you, you could... It's almost like you're giving them hope and then you take it away from them you know oh here we go we're going to help you okay and they believe that and then you just they crush because they don't get what they hope for because they do hope for that anybody with any kind of difficulties if they really want out of that dark place they want that help they need that help so when those people and this is based on many years experience when those people become more introvert uh, their health starts to fail uh, whose responsibility is that to, to manage that service if the service don't manage it, whose responsibility is it to, to oversee and make sure that they do? Whose responsibility is that? Well, it'll be the ones, the bodies that um, overlook the services and make sure that they should be doing the job right. I mean, it's adult social care and CQC. They should be making sure that they are doing their job right. And if they're not, get really tough. So we recently had a situation at Walton Hall, which... I believe is in the northeast. I could be wrong. I'm not sure where it's. We had a situation where people with learning disabilities were regularly beaten by staff, and the Care Quality Commission made 100 visits within 12 months to that establishment, and nothing was, was turned up. Now, if this is a body who are doing things like that, then you take it down a wee bit more to all the rest of the charities around the uh, the world or the services or whatever. Uh, in this country, um, sure there's something wrong with the system? I think it, it needs an overhaul for the adult social care and CQC because to me, for that to be missed so many times, uh, I mean if you're going to do, um, you're going to do a spot check and go and check if something's not right, you don't tell people you're going to do it, you just do it. You get in there and you do it, you, you catch them. Um, and also, um, I think, I mean, maybe it's a bit sneaky, I think people who work with CQC should get jobs with these people and infiltrate what's going on and see what's going on and then refer back to CQC. Well, actually, I've got a job here, but actually you're working for CQC and then you go back and you report back exactly what's going on and then it actioned. Not just ignored until people are physically hurt. You get in there and you just... Sort it out, right? If it means closing down the service, you close it down. You find a better one for the people that's in there. So if I if I ask you the question, and I probably know the answer because you've been involved in quite a number of concerns I had about provision <coughs> within this area. Not everybody, but certain quarters. Yeah. Uh, would you say that the the bodies that oversee the people who who I had and still have got concerns about their service provision? Should that body have done more in relation to those concerns? Did the CQC roll over and basically make life easy for themselves, just as they did at Walton Hall? Yes, and I think somebody has to oversee CQC, some government body that actually will make them do for them what they're supposed to be doing for other people, um, go through their service, see what they're doing. Um, because if that's what's happening, then they're, they're useless. It's a blunt tool, isn't it? What possible use are they? If they're going to go into a service where they've been told there's problems and they're going to ignore it. It's just lip service. And what about 
interviewing people who are part of those concerns. Individuals with uh, lower levels of cognition, uh, lots of conditioning, a fear of authority. If you go in based on concerns and then you interview someone that's like that, are you likely to get any results? No, and I also feel if they're going to be working with people with learning disabilities, they should have training. Uh, to be able to um, pick up on certain things, uh, pick up when somebody's been conditioned or there's a problem. They need some kind of training. Uh, they can't just walk in and expect them to be able to converse with them. They don't know them. You know, <laughs> they, they haven't built up any kind of relationship with them. So how can they possibly know? And they should have people within CQC that does that job, that is their job. They're trained to do that. That They come in and they will spend a, a, a reasonable measure of time working with those people closely to develop that relationship so they get what's going on. And you can't just do it overnight. It doesn't happen after two or three weeks. So look at Walton Hall, and I agree with you. A uh, horrible situation, and it was well publicised. It'll go away, it's the same as every other one's gone away. Yeah. Um, if people are employed with CQC, who have a background in care, they've got a good grounding experience, they understand what's going on. You could say that these people who were abusing the individuals were good actors, that they were able to cover and cloak. Should we have people who are able to suss those people out? Yes. You need people who have training in how to um, see through people who have certain characteristics. Um, and you can get that training, you, you know, you have that experience. Uh, I think a lot of people who have suffered um, in life through trauma are very intuitive. I mean, it doesn't take you long if you have that intuitive way about you to pick up when somebody is not being honest. Um, because they work so hard at being a certain way that you see right through it. And, you know, within any time at all, you think, yeah, right, you know, you're lying to me. I mean, you can. I mean, I've done it myself, not because I'm trying to do it, it just happens, and I think because of my life experiences, I've seen it at work, I've seen it with people I'm, you know, customers I'm dealing with, I've seen it in the services, you can tell them with the body language and everything, it's like, you're saying one thing, but your body's telling me something else. So what about the client, or the clients, uh, when they're exposed to people who eventually are found out to be abusers. Would you be able to tell from the body language of the client when they're close to the people who you're talking to, the staff? Would there be certain things that the service user would, would display, client, whatever word you want to use? Um, are there things that you should be able to pick up? It might be that the actual client's uncomfortable around that member of staff. If you find that, and you're in there for concerns that have been flagged up, then that's part of the road you've got to go down. That member of staff quite clearly has made that person feel uncomfortable. If you excluded all the other external stimuli, and it's only that, and, and you do it again, you come back, expose the client to the individual, you're going to get a good sense there's something wrong there. Yeah. There's no what we call therapeutic relationship there. It's really obvious. I mean, I, I remember when I first started with SS2, and... Um, it doesn't take you very long to pick up on certain things and the people I picked up very quickly where the people who were obviously having difficulties away from SS2 they, 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 they don't even look at you um, they're very uncomfortable with strangers they don't like physical touch and they don't like you in the spit there's all kinds of things and you pick up on it very quickly if you if you have that intuition you see it then go oh, wait a minute here if something's wrong and I remember asking you in the early days about, oh, I've noticed such and such. Oh, you picked up on that. Oh, that's because of, because you knew the history. All ah, right. You ask the questions. And if you were CQC, you don't just talk to the service staff. You talk to the families, if they've got families. You know, how are they, how do you see this person? People who are outside of the services and maybe spend a bit of time. How do you see this person? Have you seen changes? How do you feel they are? You talk to people. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's very strange for me that they could walk into somewhere and not pick up there's something wrong with a person. It's weird the move. 
the agitation or the stillness or the or the fact they don't look at you or yeah. there's all kinds of things. It's got to be, it's got to be more extensive. Yeah, I, it, I think just to, to round that off because it is a big subject. We'll come up in the next podcast. Um, in the absence of, of having that provision to ensure people's mental health and well-being is looked after, uh, you, you're going to have a lot of problems down, you know, down in time. Um, and of course, the end result is the situation which we had with Walt Hall yeah. and the one prior to that, which name I can never remember, uh, Winterbourne, um, which is horrible because the people that were exposed to that will never ever recover from that. They're always going to be quite nervous, you know, in the system. Uh, they'll, they'll, they'll find it very hard to trust people because yeah, that's a major thing for people who who are in in a service. It's trusting people, um, clients that, that that come here. Uh, we've experienced situations where there is no trust between that individual and a member of staff, and that that is it's it's implicit to to, to provide and care. It has to be in place. Yeah. There has to be trust. You know, the individual has to be able to trust everybody that they work with. Yeah. <clears throat> and if they can't, and then it's not managed properly, then you've got big problems later on. And that person's mental health is suffering every day, and every week, and every month, yeah, and is. every year. Uh, and that attrition coming back round again that we yeah. mentioned before there, that is a massive amount of attrition to damage people's self-confidence, self-worth, uh, and their health and well-being. And it ultimately does affect their health. It and, does. and that that is for me a real massive red flag. If someone's health starting to fail, you can guarantee that there's something behind that. If it's not clinical, it's it's mental. I think uh, as well when you come back to the talking about training with people, exercise and trainers, personal trainers, they need that training. Absolutely, they need yeah, to know absolutely. that they are dealing with mental health issues as well. I mean, they need to be able to pick up. That wait a minute, I'm not just looking at somebody who's physically weak, there's something else going on. They need to build that relationship because they can't work with them otherwise. You can't be you and them, you need to be doing it together. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, we I'm saying we, we are talking collectively here, this, this is based on my observation and experience. We are either, we're either at that end or we're at the end where we put people onto pedestals, yeah, and it's that person's choice. You know, they're the most important person, you know, with the amount of times I've, I've heard that. And yet, they're not taking care of that person's mental health and well-being. At that time, it sounds good, but then they're going back to the, to the flat or, or their house or whatever, and they're still living with that mental health problem. Yeah. And you get people who are well-paid, who are supposed to come in and address those problems, and they don't do anything, or they don't turn up, you know. Uh, it doesn't work, basically. So, I think it should be built into any care service yeah. system, whatever we want to call it. Social care provision should have that built in, where you take care of people's mental health. Yeah. Physical, mental, both together. Yeah. Um, and then you're more likely to, to, to avoid uh, the situation I mentioned earlier about Winterbourne and, and Walton Hall. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's many individual abuse cases that take place, you know, which are also ignored as well. Uh, so I, I think if you build that in, to your service, then the chances, if you look at the induction, the interviewing process, you know, the whole thing, the chances of a client being exposed to that are much, much less. You know, you can't totally eradicate yeah. because there's always going to that one person maybe slip through, but you can cut it down to, to a bare minimum. And if it's found out to be so, then you get rid of that person. I think as well, um, you know, we've talked about um, access for people in services to get physically fit and it's difficult if not impossible and we've worked in people you know in such as Nigel's home it's personalized you're building up that um, trust when you're doing something like that now that's really important to me I mean if you if you have people who need um, mobility work and such as that to help with the hips or the, the bodies and stuff it would be beneficial to be able to do that in their homes. And then you can progress them further to their capabilities, physical, you know, strength and that. Because we'd notice that people get weak, or they get overweight, or they get whatever. Um, so the the things that I was dealing with are the same things that people can deal with in yeah, the services. Yeah, it, it runs in tandem. It does. And that had a massive effect on your mental health yeah. and well-being, which I'm going to come on to now. How was that for a nice connection there? <laughs> um, 
currently where you are now, yeah. do you want to tell the listeners uh, how you're feeling and contrast that to the stages earlier, the very outset, and then right the way through to where you are now? In a small window. Um, how I am now is strong, physically stronger and some of the pain I was uh, enduring has reduced. It won't ever go all the way, but it's reduced. It's become more manageable. Um, I still suffer after a workout, but it doesn't last quite so long. My endurance has improved. That's great. I'm not as exhausted. I do get very tired, but yeah, you know, that's the way it is. Mentally, I'm stronger. I'm able to cope with everyday stresses much better because the focus I've developed through the exercise has been very beneficial. And I'm moving that focus and using it under things as well. So it, it's not just the exercise it became really good for, it also became good for other things to give me that focus. Especially if I've got things coming at me that overwhelm me. I'm, I'm able to get myself off the floor a bit quicker. <laughs> so if we look at attrition and we look at the elements of self-worth, self-confidence and self-belief, Yeah. Where are you now in relation to where you were way back when? I'm more at ease with myself. I'm more at ease in my own skin. That's nice. You know, that's really nice. To not feel like you want to get out of your own skin. Um, it's almost like I feel at all at peace in some ways. Um, I get those times now, which is nice. I never had it before. I move differently, uh, I feel stronger in myself physically and it's, it's, it's transferred into how I physically move. I used to always be kind of like hunched, now I'm just walking <laughs> freely and I'm looking where I'm going, whereas before it was the floor, it was always the floor. I always, always expect myself to fall on my face, that's why I'm doing that, but my balance has improved. So now I can actually see what's going on around me, I didn't used to notice that so much. That's nice. Um, and that's that's related to your mental health well-being as well. The fact that the physical um, work you've been doing and so continue to do does that ultimately affect people's uh, mental health, the way they feel? Well, we are talking about a panacea for all the ills of mental health conditions, but but it, it, for me, and you come to the question in a moment, for me it does work. Yeah. It actually helps that person to live a better quality of life if they're physically stronger. They become more confident. Uh, the physical uh, ability then feeds into the mm -hmm. to the mental health, because if the, if they look better and they feel stronger, then they're more likely to feel better in, in the mental health as well. So, would you think that that, that is beneficial for your mental health? It and, is. And how is it? There are things I've been dealing with the last year and a half that if I hadn't developed physically stronger and more endurance that uh, improved my mental health I wouldn't have been able to cope with. Um, there is times where I have literally been on the floor. I've been so overwhelmed and frightened I've gone down mm -hmm. and then there's this voice on me, in my head going right you can get up off your feet and you can do this because you've done this. Right okay so I get up. I've see me in the past to stay on the floor uh, because I didn't know how to get up. I was fighting to be able to cope with the, this overwhelming the emotional stuff. I just couldn't fight through it. It took me longer. So because physically I've achieved things, mentally it's made me feel stronger. I've done this so mentally I know I can do that. Emotionally I wait a minute, I feel stronger. Right, I'm going to get up off this floor and I'm going to do what I need to do. Uh, because I can do it, because I've achieved this. And that's how it transferred. It's, it was a strange thing, really. I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that transference of this, of achieving in one thing and it transferred it to another. Because you wouldn't see the connection, but it is, it's there. And it was a natural connection. I didn't even think about it. It just happened. It's not, it doesn't mean you don't go down. It just means that you manage to get back up a bit quicker than you thought. Or, it doesn't keep you down because I've been lucky to get myself up but sometimes it's taken me a while and I've thought it's going to break, I'm going to break, I can't take much more. Now 
I feel stronger as in, right, okay, that's coming at me, but that's all right because I know I'm stronger and I can face this. So that's the difference. That so, makes let's, sense. so let's sum up then. This is the summative section. <laughs> um, we, we've, we've come across quite a lot of stuff during this podcast, but then we always do. Uh, we've touched on a future podcast in relation to, to mental health provision, uh, but we are talking specifically about your personal journey from yeah. being unhealthy uh, to, to, to being a lot more healthy physically and mentally, and you mentioned emotionally as well, yeah. because you can't remove the emotions from your mental health and your physical health because they're all part of the same thing. So just to sum up, uh, would you like to tell the listeners what you would recommend based on what we've talked about? Uh, if they're struggling at the moment to even get out of bed, what would your message be to them in relation to, to your journey and the benefits, the things you've achieved? What, what, what message would you send out to people? Um, if you're struggling in that way, I think my first suggestion was to try and do something in your own space, even if it's just a yoga or something like that. And then when you feel a little bit more confident, go with a friend if you've got one that will go with you, go to, into a, a, a gym where it's maybe more catered towards women, uh, if possible, and ask for help, you know, get somebody that can guide you. But watch how that person guides you don't just take it all as gospel work it out yourself right okay they're saying this to me if they push you too hard you stand up for you and, right okay i'm not going to be pushed do it gradually so that would be my advice just to stick your toe in the water a wee bit and see how it feels um, and if you've got somebody who'll go with you that's great you've got support um, and I would suggest that and see how that goes. Once you've got some kind of idea what to do, you could do some other exercise. You could try cycling or walking or jogging away from, say, a gym environment. You could uh, get some equipment, if possible, some one or two weights you could do or resistance bands once you've got an idea what to do. And make it your own connect to it in a way that's yours, whatever it is you choose to do. Uh, because I think that would be a really good start. And then just see how it goes, and just see where you want to go with it, how do you feel about it, where, do you have a connection to it, can you see a goal, do, think about it, read up on it, you know, do some research. But you need to connect to that yourself. Do you make the journey personal to yourself? You have to, yes. Otherwise, you're going to walk away from it. It won't be beneficial. Right, Trey, thank you very much. We're going to wrap this up now. But before we go, we've had lots of positives yeah. in here. Uh, we're going to wrap it up with um, Trey's denim shorts. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, OK. One so a slight st negative. <laughs> One slight negative. Um, I was seven and a half stone when I started this journey underweight and I'd been there at that stage because that happen, happens often and I'd been three years at seven and a half stone not a good place to be so obviously you buy clothes when you're seven and a half stone and I bought clothes and I got some more when I was eight stone because gradually I, I increased weight and I bought these shorts last year last summer when I was half a stone or more lighter than I am now and I hadn't tried them on again since because it hasn't been warm enough. And this morning, I'm struggling to get these shorts and I think, it's truth. I mean, I'm not fat. I'm kind of, I've developed some muscle on my thighs, legs, everywhere really. And getting into these shorts was a hoot. I mean, I'm pulling them up and thinking, it's, oh, it's still too big on the waist because my waist isn't getting any bigger, but everything else is developing. So yeah, that was funny. That was like, I can't bend over in these, I can't do, God, I need new shorts. <laughs> so that's what, that was one kind of, I mean, the negative to that is you have to buy new clothes, and that's an expense. However, the positive to that is I'm not as skinny as I was. <laughs> but but you've put, you put a lot of time and effort into to building that muscle, and we are talking about big 
muscle where you're walking around like like you're on muscle. Well, beach. I was so small and I was shrunk. You know, Skeleton I, stronger now. Yeah. Now, I mean, you go from seven and a half stone till just under nine stone. That's a lot of weight gain. I know OK's taken over three years because it was hard work. The last 12 months I've gained the most weight because I, I started to develop, develop that muscle because I was getting physically stronger to be able to do that. I never thinking about your clothes. I mean, they say they should check that out with tape measure and everything, but with the weights. I mean, it, it's like, I, I don't, I haven't bought any new clothes for over 12 months, so I never thought about, oh, can I get in this show? So I just thought, oh, it's truth. So, I, I mean, I shouldn't really have mentioned that. <laughs> it's a bone of contention, Patricia, and it was this morning when she walked out of a bungalow. Yeah, you know, you kind of... extremely uncomfortable and trying to hide. Uh, but, of course, typically of me, I just made sure I highlighted it. Um, <laughs> for anybody listening, the, 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 this actually for, for Trey is a positive because she's got stronger. Her legs are stronger now. Not everybody's going to develop the same way. Uh, Trey's been training quite holistically for, for a few years now. Uh, she's become the person that she, she always w was going to be. Uh, as she goes on the journey, she's going to become leaner anyway. Yeah, That's but we've noticed the tops are getting tighter as well. I just Absol forgot to mention that. Absolutely, I've noticed Trey. Yeah, the um, tops are tighter now. I can't afford to get in a motor just yet. <laughs> But, but it, it may well be that you don't lift weights and you might do yoga, you might do Pilates, you might just, just go cycling, you might go for walks or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I think you pretty much picked up from what Trey said that there are massive benefits for, um, for, for people who are struggling with, them, what, with depression, anxiety, any kind of mental health condition. Uh, it'll get you out there doing something. Yes, it uh, will. And there are massive benefits in relation to how you feel about yourself, your emotions. Uh, you feel stronger, more positive, there's more focus. You've mentioned yeah. quite a few things back there. And it does actually transcend, transcend into other areas. You actually become more adept in other areas. You focus because you're stronger and, you, and you've got more belief in yourself. You're more likely to try different things and probably become more successful at different things. Yes, you, you so know. it does actually transcend into other parts of your life. It's not just in the gym or in wherever you go to. Um, so, we're going to round off. Yeah. Is it, do you want to round it off or do you want me to round it off? You can round it off. <laughs> You're better at it than me. Right. <laughs> uh, any questions about that? Because quite often our podcast can become quite inflammatory. But I don't see it as inflammatory. I see it as being honest about what's going on. Yeah. If you've got any questions or you've got any uh, uh, criticisms mm -hmm. of, of this podcast, well, we're not interested. But if you've got any positives about the podcast, we're very interested. <laughs> so I want to thank Trey for being so brutally honest. And we are going to come back to this because the journey hasn't finished. No, it hasn't. Um, and if you want to check out Trey's progress on the blog, please do so. And again, if you've got any comments, if you've got any questions for Trey, please do uh, address them to Trey through the, um, the blog or the FB page. Yeah. Uh, and we'll see you again, folks. Thank you, Trey. Thank you. That's a wrap.